Welcome to the Titan Talks webinar to listen to and learn from the sixth speaker in this relatively new Titan Talks innovation series. I'm John Corton. I'm the director of the Petrick Idea Center at Illinois Wesleyan University. For those of you who haven't heard yet about our plans for the Petrick Idea Center, we're building a state-of-the-art 43,000 square foot living, learning, and creating community on the beautiful IWU campus on the southwest corner of the quad between Buck Memorial Library and the Memorial Center. It will have flexible common areas, a fully equipped maker and creator spaces, and residential capacity for 78 of the university's most innovative and entrepreneurially minded students. Here, all students at Illinois Wesleyan across every major and discipline will practice collaborative, cross-discipline creativity with the conscience as they live, learn, and create 24 seven. There they'll also develop their skills and their superpowers, and they'll build the products, services, and initiatives that will result in truly virtuous solutions to vital problems. The Petrick Ideas Center is gonna offer students, alumni, and the community lifelong learning and engagement opportunities. And this quarterly innovation series, which we first introduced in January of 2022, it's a perfect example of what's to come. This series will feature alumni and university supporters, like our speaker today, who are creating, changing, and disrupting the products, the services, the systems, and the policies that will exist in the mid 21st century world. I'm joining you today from Barcelona, Spain, where marketing professor Dr. Gavin Leach and I are leading on a 23 day May term experience with 19 students from a wide variety of majors that has already visited the Canary Islands and will next go to Italy to learn more about innovation and entrepreneurship in these three very different areas of Europe. Our group today just completed a visit with Rich Kurzman, a 1998 IW graduate who is CEO and founder of Barcelona Student Study Abroad Exchange. Rich and his staff helped coordinate our visit to Barcelona and our upcoming visit to Italy, and I'm thankful for the use of their offices uh, today. A few housekeeping items before we get started with today's webinar. You're viewing this webinar as an audience member, and therefore you're, you will not have the ability to turn on your video or your microphone. Questions can be submitted at any time through the Q&A feature there in Zoom. Alan will answer questions during and at the end of the presentation. And if you have a technical issue, you may reach out to the Office of Alumni Engagement at phone number about to come, 309-556-3145, or you can email their office at iwualum at iwu.edu. A recording of today's webinar will be available to view on the Office of Alumni Engagement YouTube page, and you'll be sent a link in a short survey in the days ahead. Illinois Wesleyan is very honored to have Dr. Alan Gregerman as the sixth speaker of our innovation series. Alan is the founder, president, and chief innovation officer of VentureWorks Incorporated. He's also an award-winning and best-selling author, entrepreneur, a consultant, teacher, keynote speaker, and community volunteer who has been called one of the most original thinkers in business today and the Robin Williams of business consulting. His talks on innovation and unlocking genius have inspired more than 300,000 300, people around the world. Alan's work, his research and speaking and writing focus on helping people and companies to innovate, grow, and to deliver the most compelling value to their customers. His three books, The Necessity of Strangers, Surrounded by Geniuses, and lessons from the sandbox have been translated in 15 languages and challenge our thinking in a fun, accessible, and impactful way about people, the world around us, how innovation and brilliance actually occur, and how to reach out and how to reach our full potential as individuals, leaders, and organizations. With that, Alan, the floor is yours. Please take it away. Great. Thank you, John, and uh, thanks to all of you for being here, and it's a pleasure to be part of Titan Talks, and um, I'm delighted to spend some time and share with you some insights about innovation and to exchange ideas. I'll look forward to any questions that you have along the way. Um, thanks for the kind introduction. As John mentioned, I spend most of my time thinking about innovation, either with our customers or in the kind of research speaking and writing that I do. Um, uh, John mentioned my books. Um, I'm currently finishing up a book about the power of being open-minded, um, but if you'd like to read something now, my most recent book was The Necessity of Strangers. It's all about the power of connecting with people 
um, who are different than you. And so I'd love you to think about that idea along the way. While I'm not an alum of Illinois Wesleyan University, I'm passionate about um, IWU. My wife is an alum, um, a very proud alum of the nursing school. And um, we talk about Illinois Wesleyan a lot and we'll be heading back to campus for homecoming this year. Um, I'm also really excited because I've had the opportunity to learn more about the Petrick Idea Center, and I'm both intrigued and excited about the idea of injecting innovation and infusing ideas and the power of ideas into all disciplines of a liberal arts education. Um, so I think that's an awesome idea, and I think what IWU is doing is fantastic. So um, with no further ado, let me get started. Um, we have a limited amount of time today. I often joke that I could talk about this topic for days at a time. But what I want to accomplish in the time we have together is first to help you think in a little bit of a different way about innovation and how we can make innovation more accessible to all of us. The second thing I'd like to do is I'd like to share with you some specific ideas that you can use tomorrow uh, or today, if you've got a little bit of time left, um, to unlock your own brilliance and create value for yourself and the company or organization you work for. Um, feel free to connect with me um, after this program, if you'd like. Feel free to connect on LinkedIn or Instagram or send me an email. Um, I promise to respond. Um, so let's get started. And you'll notice I'm wearing a raincoat. It's not raining here, but it's part of what we'll talk about. And so um, let's go. It's a rainy afternoon in 1948, and a retired chemist named George de Mistral is walking his dog through the Alps. And as he walks his dog through the Alps, he notices that his dog and his clothes are covered with burrs, those sticky little things that we often get stuck on our clothing when we're taking a hike or get stuck on a dog. Um, dogs have actually been human pets for about 6,000 years. So one might imagine for 6,000 years, people walk through the Alps or wherever you are and got burrs on them. Um, and as he takes these burrs off of his dog, George has a different idea about them than most people do. Most people for 6,000 years probably thought they were a nuisance. George thought they were awesome. So awesome, in fact, that he took these burrs back to his apartment or chalet and looked at them under an old microscope. And as he looked at them and their amazing power to stick to dogs and things, George got excited. In fact, so excited that he started to draw pictures in a notebook about burrs um, and imagined all the ways that burrs could be used to improve the quality of human life. Um, George showed these notes to his friends who thought he was crazy, but George kind of continued on with his passion for burrs, in fact, patented in the Swiss trademark office the idea for burrs and soon began to work with people to develop applications for burrs. Today, fast forward, burrs are found in over 100,000 products um, that we might regularly use. What George had discovered through a walk with his dog in the park was Velcro, a marvel of modern science not invented by scientists in a lab. Let me un-Velcro my raincoat because it's getting a little bit hot in here, but invented by a guy walking his dog in the woods. That's an interesting story, but most importantly, when you think about that story, I want you to think about the fundamental thing that separated George from all of his peers. And that fundamental thing was George was curious. So if we wanna talk about innovation, what we need to talk about is first the simple idea that we all have the ability to be curious and curiosity is really the key to innovation. Curiosity is kind of the driving force. It's somebody, an individual or a company or organization looking at something around them and imagining that maybe there's an idea, spark of an idea, or the possibility that they can think about something that's remarkable. That's fundamental to what I want you to think about. 
The other thing tied to that that I want you to think about is something that George is really a good illustration of. It's what I call the 99% rule. It turns out throughout the course of human history, and there have been, I have a globe here, roughly 7,000 cultures on the planet, distinct cultures through the course of human history. Throughout the course of human history, 99% of all new ideas have been based on somebody else's thinking or something that someone has found in nature. Now, that should change the equation for all of us as we imagine the need of our companies or organizations to remain relevant, innovative, and successful. And that need becomes even greater as the world moves faster all around us. But the power of thinking about the simple notion that almost all ideas are based on some ideas that already exist should change the way we think. Picture the scene in your company or organization when you need to be brilliant and innovative. Typically, if it's you or somebody else who's responsible for coming up with a new idea, you assemble your smartest colleagues in a wonderful room, possibly filled with whiteboards, give them blank sheets of paper and say, you know, our backs are to the wall. We need to be way more brilliant than we ever have been before. Does anybody have an out-of-the-box idea? And as you ask people for an out-of-the-box idea, you can see them kind of racking their brains and going, gosh, I need to turn on the part of my brain that's all about innovation, don't I? I need to come up with something original. Well, that's how an awful lot of companies view innovation, getting smart people together. They'd be way better off if they just let people leave the building in search of ideas and inspiration that could spark their thinking. And again, it goes back to the simple notion that curiosity is what ought to drive us. So I want you to think about first the idea that innovation doesn't occur as we're often told that it does. Innovation is in fact a spark of brilliance, but it's sparked by actually getting out and seeing something remarkable that sparks our ability to think. So imagine this. As a child, I was fascinated. I'm coming back here. I was fascinated by helicopters. Now, maybe it was because I was a guy and I had the transportation gene, but I was fascinated by the notion that something so big could literally go straight up in the air, hang out there, go forward, come down, deliver supplies, rescue somebody, do something super cool, and then go back straight in the air and head home. I thought that the helicopter was truly the creation of a genius, an innovator who had just one day said, wow, that's a cool thing to think about the idea of vertical flight. It turns out the guy who invented the helicopter or is credited with inventing the helicopter, a guy named Igor Sikorsky, a Russian or actually Ukrainian immigrant to the United States was a fairly clever guy. But it turns out more importantly, as an 11 year old boy in 1900, in the markets of Kiev or Kiev, he bought a toy. And that toy some of you might recognize was a toy called the Chinese top. It turns out 2000 years ago, the Chinese had thought about vertical flight. And so Sikorsky finds this toy and he is enamored with this toy and he plays with it. So for those of you who don't know, the original Chinese tops were made out of very light wood, but basically you'd kind of just roll it like this in your hand and then fly it like that, a toy that could go straight up in the air. Sikorsky thought that was so cool that he imagined as an 11 year old, the possibility someday humans could go up and do that. Now Sikorsky was, curious for sure, and decided to go to a library. He certainly lived before the internet. And so he went to his local library and found a librarian who directed him to a bunch of things to read related to flight and vertical flight. Flight was just starting. Remember, it's 1903. The Wright brothers will fly their plane a few feet over the beach and Kitty Hawk, and that will be the first airplane flight. But Sikorsky got really excited, and the librarian, to her credit, was fairly clever. And she said, you know, you ought to think about a really clever guy named Leonardo da Vinci. Da Vinci was 
fairly clever and John and his students may be learning more about da Vinci as they travel in Italy. Da Vinci considered a Renaissance man, a little bit easier to be a Renaissance man during the Renaissance, but be that as it may, if you Google Leonardo da Vinci helicopter, you'll see pictures of something that Leonardo da Vinci thought about um, hundreds of years ago, a vertical flight craft. Never built one, never built a model, just drew some pictures. Was da Vinci brilliant? Absolutely. Was da Vinci inspired by the world around him? Absolutely as well. Because it turns out on his balcony in Florence, da Vinci saw these guys, dragonflies. Dragonflies, literally the natural embodiment of a helicopter. Now look at something really cool. I don't know if I have enough screen with, but look at this, it's kind of cool. Helicopter, right? Wide body, um, long tail for stability, landing gear, dragonflies have feet, helicopters don't exactly have feet. Um, a dragonfly is literally a helicopter waiting to happen. So Sikorsky put all this together and in 1939, in its maiden voyage, unlike the Wright brothers, a few seconds over a beach, Sikorsky went up in the air in his VS-300 and for 59 minutes flew around. Hence, the vertical flight industry and the world of vertical flight was changed forever. Kind of a cool thing. And again, a guy being curious and putting together a bunch of ideas from a bunch of strangers from 2000 years ago, 500 years ago, and imagining a world filled with possibilities. The challenge for all of us is actually to look at the world differently, to see remarkable things, and to ask questions about what matters to us and what matters to our companies or organizations. The challenge for us is really to be our full, curious, and innovative selves to spark our thinking in new ways. Now, I know that you're probably thinking, okay, that's great, but there must be places, companies filled with creative people they don't need, in fact, to wander around thinking about the 99% rule or thinking about how the world changes. Actually, that's pretty far from the truth because it turns out the world's most creative and curious companies are remarkably keen on the ideas of other people. They use that as the starting point for being brilliant. Let me ask all of you, and while I can't see all of you there, um, I will assume that the answer is kind of sort of yes. So I'll ask you, how many of you now use an iPhone or an iPad um, to listen to music or play digital content? My guess is a fair number because the folks at Apple kind of ruled the world of digital content play. Well, that's kind of a cool thing. And the folks at Apple are kind of brilliant. They work and live in that giant donut in Cupertino, California. Um, but the reality is, let's think about this, because the original iPod, the first Apple digital content player, made its debut in 2004, not that long ago, 19 years ago. And it was kind of a marvel. And I somewhere have one here. But you know, it was a little thing and I could take it to go running and it held 1500 songs. That's 2004. So think about that. Okay. But now think about this. It's 1979. And as I walk across the Diag at the University of Michigan, I am the coolest person on campus because unlike everybody else, I'm the proud possessor of a Sony walk person. I call it a walk person because two of our three kids are girls, so I would not call it a walk man. Let me get the earphones on, though. Um, so I'm the proud possessor of a Sony walk person. 1979, 25 years before Apple comes up with the iPad. And I am literally a party waiting to happen because I can take my music in multiples of 12 songs, all by the same artist, wherever I want to go. And if at the time my earphones were splittable, I could give music to somebody else or I could attach it to a speaker um, and my music was portable. Kind of a brilliant idea. 
So it turns out the folks at Apple who now rule the world of digital and portable music didn't invent the idea. One could say the folks at Sony, another great company, ruled the world of digital music as well. Um, and that would actually be a little bit of a stretch, but we'll get to that in a second. Now, the technology that allows you to have all that video and streaming and stuff on here um, is called MP3 technology. Did Apple invent that? Actually not. That was invented by two German engineers in 1986. So the idea of portable or digitized music, the technology of portable or digitized music um, was not invented by Apple at all but they figured out a slick, cool, intuitive, better way to put these things together. And I would argue the kind of system around it, um, which was the Apple store, the iTunes store, one of those stores, um, is a 2300 year old idea. So the technology, 20 years before Apple came up with it, the idea 25 years before, and in the year 300 or so um, BC, in the great city of Alexandria, Egypt, up here, the north coast of Africa, the Egyptians invented a library. It was called the Great Library of Alexandria. Um, not sure it rivals the library at Illinois Wesleyan or another great university, but um, the Egyptians realized 2,300 years ago that whoever had the most content was likely to create the biggest empire. And the Egyptians built a library that had 460,000 handwritten documents, what the Egyptians believed was the sum total of the world's knowledge at that time. Um, the Egyptians hadn't been to a bunch of places and frankly didn't know that a bunch of places existed, but what the Egyptians realized was knowledge was power. So now fast forward to today, the folks at Apple realize having the biggest library of content um, is a way to build an economic empire, same as the folks at Netflix and Amazon and Alibaba and all kinds of places. So a lot of cool ideas. Now, one might even imagine the Walkman was pretty cool, but remember, I'm keenly focused on the 99% rule is the Walkman was simply leveraging another idea that happened 30 years before it. And that idea was something many of you may not have seen, um, but your grandparents may have called the transistor radio. Um, what was the transistor radio? It was an awesome thing that allowed me to listen to my favorite radio stations wherever I went. Uh, reception was uneven, but the transistor radio was awesome. Um, now, if you want to imagine something even more peculiar, I recall growing up in San Francisco, having my transistor radio under my pillow and listening to San Francisco Giants baseball games as I would head to sleep. And my parents saying something like, you know, you shouldn't use technology before you go to sleep. Uh, fast forward to today. But let me even give you another similarity that you'll all relate to. So transistor radio, radio stations. What are radio stations? They're curated music. I can listen to radio stations that are jazz or classical or popular or country music or whatever your preference is. Um, and now I would imagine for all of you listening and certainly all of the students and maybe some of the rest of you, um, that you have a subscription to something called Spotify. What is Spotify? It's curated music based on your preference for music delivered in a digital and way cooler format than a transistor radio, but it's an 80 year old idea. So I'd love you to think about the power of different ideas and realize that even the most sophisticated and most creative companies tend to win by being open to the ideas of other folks. It's just simply the way innovation really occurs. So I'd love you to think about the 99% rule. 
I'd also love you to imagine that oftentimes innovation occurs because not only do folks see what's going on in the world around them and leverage that, but folks look at the world around them and see challenges that could be better addressed by having new and fresh ideas. And there are a bunch of things that I'd love you to think about. But fundamental to that, I'd love you to think about the idea that having an open mind and not being entirely wedded to what we've studied in school or already know or the things we've worked on actually helps us to be way more innovative than we'd ever imagined. Simply asking, is there a better way? So imagine this. The world's largest hospitality company is Marriott Corporation, and they have roughly 8,000 hotels around the world. And those 8,000 hotels combined have about 950,000 rooms. Nowhere at Marriott, because they were focused on hotels, did they ever imagine a revolution that could occur in the world of hospitality. Three friends, though, did who knew nothing about hospitality. But they knew that when they went to a conference in San Francisco and it was hard to find an affordable room, that there had to be another option for people who needed a place to stay. Their initial thought was couch surfing. They imagined that there were all kinds of people who had an extra sofa and would be willing to host somebody. What it evolved into in 13 years is something called Airbnb. And if you go on the Airbnb website today, you can rent apartments, entire homes, tree houses, um, boat houses, all kinds of things around the world. In 13 years, they now have 6 million places where you can stay, like this row house in San Francisco. And so the folks at Airbnb imagined that there had to be a different alternative, either lower cost or more interesting, or giving you an opportunity to really feel like you were a local in some place. It was all by being open-minded because in fact, they didn't know a lot about the hospitality industry. That's kind of a cool idea that we could actually interrupt or disrupt an entire industry without knowing a ton about it, just simply by being open-minded about how we could do a better job. Some of you, until the kind of winter meltdown of Southwest Airlines computer systems, probably liked Southwest Airlines. In 1966, the folks at Southwest Airlines came up with a better way to fly, or they thought it was a better way to fly. It was a way to fly that had fewer hassles. It had fewer costs. It had fewer changes of planes. Um, it offered fewer amenities, but it offered them with a smile and a bit of a sense of humor. It was the alternative to American and United and Delta. And it was an airplane that kind of was cool and fun. And it developed an incredible sense of allegiance. Herb Kelleher, the guy who founded Southwest Airlines, knew very, very little about the airline industry. In fact, he conceived of Southwest Airlines while having lunch with a friend at a restaurant and wrote down his notes for how he'd create a better airline, starting in Dallas, Texas, on the back of a napkin. In fact, when he was interviewed several years later on NPR um, and asked if he would start an airline again, he replied, I knew so little about starting an airline. If I'd known more, I never would have done it. And yet until this past winter, Southwest was by far the most popular airline in the United States, popular because it had a different approach. Think of Uber or other folks who started businesses to create or reinvent industries, combining an understanding that they could be better with new and emerging technologies. In Uber's case, it's simply GPS, um, a technology that had evolved um, over many, many years, but a technology that allowed someone with a car to find someone who needed a ride and to match them up as opposed to standing on a corner hoping that you hail a taxi cab. So there are lots of ideas out there about people who use curiosity, imagining things could be better um, to strengthen kind of the world by offering greater value. Whatever you're working on or whatever your company or organization's working on, simply step back and say to yourself, is there a better way? The reality is um, that you'll either find a 
better way or somebody else will. Um, and so it's way better if you do. So I want you to think about the fundamental notions that curiosity and the fact that the world is filled with ideas provides us all the ability to be remarkably creative and innovative. But let's pause for a moment, because unfortunately, um, most of us are not open to other ideas or the insights of other people. And because we're not open, we miss so many chances to really kind of reach our full potential by combining what we know with what other people know. To get you to really understand this, what I'd like to do is take you to Europe um, in the middle of the 1800s, 1846 to be exact. Um, and I'd like you to think about the amazing history of swimming strokes. So many of you out there probably are swimmers, either recreationally or your parents asked you to be on a swim team when you were growing up. And it turns out you probably all know or you've watched swimming and you probably all know that in any major swim competition today, the Olympics, the World Championships, um, the NCAA Championships, Division Three Championships, um, the local swim club, four strokes are used in every competition. And those strokes are the freestyle, the backstroke, which is kind of like the freestyle, but on your back, um, the breaststroke, kind of a cool stroke, and the butterfly, okay? So those are the four strokes that are used. It turns out um, that three of them are pretty fast and one of them is not so fast. That's the breaststroke. It's kind of a funky stroke. You displace a lot of water. The kick patterned after a frog, not as fast as a dolphin, which is the other kicks. Um, the favorite stroke of 80-year-old German women in the Baltic Sea. But I mention that only because in the mid-1800s, the only swimming stroke that Northern Europeans had learned was actually the breaststroke. And whenever they had a swim meet, all they did was swim the breaststroke. Well, we're going to go to a swim meet in a lake in London. And let me put my goggles on to get you guys in the mood for swimming. And so we're going to go to swim meet in the middle of London. Swim meet's about to begin. And all the leading swimmers from throughout Northern Europe let's find it on a map, have come to the swim meet. They're from the British Isles, of course. France and Germany and Holland and Belgium, even swimmers from the Nordic countries, um, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, and Norway. Um, may have been a swimmer from Spain, for those of you who are in Spain right now. And they've all come to a lake and they're going to swim races, all of which are swimming the breaststroke. Kind of a funky stroke. At the meet's beginning, just before the first race, two visitors show up at the lake. They're from South America. They love to swim, and they'd heard that a swim meet was about to take place. And so they go up to the meet organizer and ask if they can participate. The meet organizer, delighted that people have come from so far um, and eager to show them how wonderfully Europeans swim, says that would be awesome. And so they invite them to swim and the guests simply say, tell us what to do. And the organizer says at the appointed time, races will begin. We'll start on the bank of the river. We'll swim out to a marker and come back and touch the bank. And whoever touches the bank first will be declared the winner. The races will begin by us firing a gun up in the air. Don't worry, we'll fire blanks. And then swimmers will jump in, dive in, whatever they want to do seemed reasonable to the guests. I won't get down because you won't see me on the screen, but the first race is about to begin and the two visitors line up with all the European swimmers on the bank. The gun goes off, they dive into the water. And within a few seconds, a hush comes over the crowd because it turns out, bless their hearts, these swimmers from a distant land had no idea how to swim the breaststroke, the slowest stroke known to human beings. In fact, they were swimming a variation of the freestyle, the fastest stroke known to human beings. And within a few seconds, they were already pretty far ahead. The meat organizers were petrified. They'd never seen anybody swim like this. In fact, they imagined getting the rescue boats out because surely these people would drown. At the halfway mark, they were really far ahead. And they touched the bank way ahead of 
all of the Europeans. Turns out about 24% faster than the breaststroke. Um, and then waited patiently for everybody else to finish the race. At the end of the race, one might have imagined um, that the Northern Europeans, having seen a faster way to swim, would have in fact invited these people to teach them. Um, but they didn't. It turns out these folks stayed and swam in every race they were allowed to swim in and won every single race by a significant distance. But at the end of the meet, instead of giving them their medals and saying, hey, could you hang around for a little while longer? That's a cool way to swim. The Northern Europeans wished them well and then huddled at the side of the lake, determined to figure out how to swim the breaststroke faster. This went on for 27 years. It wasn't until 27 years later in 1873 that a young man named John Trudgeon became the coach of a leading London swim club. He'd heard about the time that visitors had come from a distant land and swam really, really fast. He was so excited by that that he took a boat to South America. And when he got there, he saw everyone swimming the freestyle. He stayed there until he mastered the stroke, took detailed pictures, which are now in a museum in London, and then came back and taught his young charges how to swim the freestyle. In the first meet they entered, they won every single race. Now Northern Europeans, having seen other Northern Europeans swim the freestyle, thought this was awesome. And the world of competitive swimming was changed forever. What's cool or sad or amazing about the story of the history of swim strokes is we now know in every place other than Northern Europe, in Central and South America, Africa, South Asia, East Asia, Australia, and the islands of the Pacific, people have been swimming a variation of the freestyle for roughly 10,000 years. So the only place where they cared about competitive swimming was the only place they had no idea how to swim fast. The reality is that all of us go to work each day or go to whatever we do, doggedly determined to be innovative, yet doggedly focused on swimming our variation of the breaststroke. It's because we're not so open to the ideas of strangers. And what I want to challenge all of you to do is to be open to ideas that are all around you, because those ideas will be the spark that will help you to think in new ways. Now, I want to do one more thing, two more things, somewhere between one and two more things um, before we wrap up, and then I'll take any of your questions. First, what I want to share with you is four fundamental principles that should be part of your life as you engage the world head on. Um, and that if you understand these principles are going to make you way more successful and way more innovative and creative. The first of these principles we've talked about already, and that is to be innovative, I need to be curious. I need to get up from where I am, wander the world around me, and be truly curious about all the remarkable things I see and how to think about combining what the world knows with what I know. The second is I have to be humble. I have to believe that I don't know it all, and that's a good thing. I have to be willing to believe that anything is possible and that I have a role to play in making it happen, but it's because I engage the world with a sense of curiosity, but also humility that there's new stuff to learn and new ways to be better. The third is I need to be respectful of every single person I meet. When I wrote the book, The Necessity of Strangers, I was profoundly focused on the simple notion that I could learn something from anyone else on the planet. And the story about swimming is really, really clear to me. It's a compelling, simple, easy to understand notion that here were these people who in some way might have been thought of by the Northern Europeans as less civilized or beneath them, who knew something that would be really helpful for the Northern Europeans to know. History is filled with those ideas. If we had more time, I'd share more of them. But so the idea is that I respect everybody and believe I can learn something from everybody else is awesome. And the fourth thing, the fourth principle is the simple notion that if I have a key purpose that drives me, some way that I want to make a difference, that I want to improve the world, that I want to improve my industry, that I want to do something that really matters. If I'm truly passionate about that and I use that purpose as a way to be curious, humble, respectful, open to learning new things, 
I have set in motion my own capability to be truly innovative or an engine of innovation. So that's the first of the one and a half things I want to share with you. The last thing before we go to questions is I'd like to share nine basic ideas, nine things you can do today or tomorrow or whenever you decide simply to begin to be more innovative or to unlock your own potential or the potential of your colleagues or those around you. The first is I'd love to challenge you to get out of your office regularly and wander around in search of remarkable ideas. You can find them everywhere. You can find them in remarkable companies that are either local or international companies within your community. Um, you can go to places, wait a second. Um, you can go to places like Ikea, the great giant Swedish home goods place and marvel at the fact, wait a second, um, that they provide very little customer service, but what they've pioneered and generate $45 billion a year in sales doing is the simple notion that you take greater responsibility for finding, wrestling to the ground and assembling your own furniture. And as a result, you get pretty good design for a much lower price. Um, I could go to Lush Cosmetics in Chicago or a city around the world and find out how these people have become rabid about natural, no animal tested cosmetics and passionate about unlocking the genius in all their people. I could do that. Um, I could take an Uber ride or go to Airbnb or someplace else. So I'd love you to think about just get up and wander around and look for things that are remarkable. I could go to a museum, a history museum or a science museum. I could go to a great performance and see how people kind of engage an audience to give me ideas about how I engage my customers in new and compelling ways. Just get out and wander around. Make that part of what you and your organization do regularly. The second is I want you to pay attention to things that are remarkable all around you. They may not directly relate to your business, but simply as we get in the mode of seeing things that are remarkable and then dissecting what makes them remarkable, it challenges us to think about how we and our organizations can be more remarkable. The third is, and it should go without saying, but it's again hard for us to do, is I'd like to challenge you to be open to ideas from other industries and other walks of life and other places around us in which remarkable things are happening. You know, And those remarkable things can be tied to your industry or tied to a, something that you volunteer or do or care about or tied to a societal problem. Imagine this, we all read today that there's a mental health crisis in America. And we're challenged to figure out in a world in which there's not enough professional support or insurance companies aren't willing to cover the cost of mental health, how we improve the mental health of folks around us, especially younger people. Um, in Zimbabwe, a psychiatrist noticed one really troubling thing. And it was in all of Zimbabwe, there were only 13 psychiatrists. He came up with an idea called the Friendship Bench, in which if he put benches and encouraged especially grandmothers to hang out at those benches, people could at least sit down, people who were experiencing challenges, and find someone who was supportive and listened. The act of putting these benches, just challenging people to connect with another human being, especially someone older who they might naturally have from some respect for, has dramatically improved in an under-resourced country um, the level of mental health that's gone on. So the remarkable ideas out there, let's just be open to them. Let's just view the entire world as a place filled with ideas that can get us started in thinking in new and remarkable ways. Tied to that, I'd love you to connect with strangers. I'd love you deliberately to connect with strangers, people you don't know, but you might read something that they've written that's remarkable, or you might just let serendipity be your guide. Actually talk to people when you're waiting in line at the movies or, or talk to people at the next table at a restaurant. I honestly believe that each day we come close to 100 people who could change our lives, but we never take the time to connect with them. The fifth is be open and aware to the pluses and minuses of your own expertise. The reality is if we only look at problems through the lens of the expertise we have and not a broader lens, 
we limit our ability to come up with ideas and solutions. The sixth is, as I mentioned, the world is changing super fast. We need to try things quickly. We need to do things faster than we've ever done them before, or somebody else will. Um, the era when we thought we wouldn't put a new product or service or solution out there until we got it perfect is long over. 80% good is awesome. Let's get stuff out there. Let's test it and try it. And then let's get feedback from the world about how we make it better. And then let's quickly make it better. So I'd love you to think about that. Um, the seventh is this simple idea that we should never be focused on perfection again, that we should absolutely be focused on getting what we're thinking about in the hands of people who might find it valuable and to challenge them to make us smarter. The eighth is, and I don't really kind of say this um, to a university group without being passionate about the power of universities, of course, but we need to be quick studies. Whatever you study in school is awesome. I actually have a PhD in geography, and yet I'm a business consultant. Um, and by all accounts, I actually am modestly successful at this. But the reality is today, as things change, most of what we know is kind of outdated. You've got to learn things quickly. The greatest thing you can learn at school is how to learn, not the specific things that you learn. And the last thing is embrace technology because technology combined with the way we've always done things or the way we could do things is the great enabler of new business models and new ways of doing things. Um, I think I've gone past my time. I'd love to share some more stuff, but I'll pause now. I appreciate you hanging in there. I'll pause now. And if there are any questions, we'll take them. Otherwise, I'll share another story or two. Okay. All right, Alan, thank you so much. Uh, first question, you've given us some great ideas on how to create a more open mindset. So you've already addressed one of the questions with your nine, with your nine uh, suggestions, but what tools or processes do you recommend people use to collaborate more effectively? Okay, so that's great. So let me give you one really simple idea. I mean, this is a huge topic. I'm guessing a lot of these questions are big topics, but imagine this. We tend to collaborate better with people we feel comfortable with and know well as people. And so here's what I'd like all of you who need to collaborate to do, and that is figure out who you need to collaborate with and hang out with those people before you ever need to collaborate with them for work. And even if that means something as simple as having coffee with them, have coffee with them and connect with them as people before you connect with them in the role that they play in the problem that you're trying to solve. A simple way to do this in an exercise we've done with over 50,000 people around the world is pair off, have coffee, um, and then try and figure out without talking about work or the project or the problem you're trying to solve, try and find 10 things you have in common with that person. The reality is by figuring out what you have in common with somebody, you're way more likely to then when you have to roll up your sleeves, be a remarkable collaborator. The second thing about collaboration that I want to talk about um, is the simple notion that collaboration works best when we bring together people's ideas and we're open to the ideas of others and we start to craft solutions in which everybody has a bit of a commitment and so we're not focused just on an idea or a solution to begin with and part of that means doing what we talked about a few moments ago and that is once i've formed a team and i build a bond and i find some common ground with folks then i set out together to explore and look at the world around me and I look for opportunities to find remarkable things that are the start of the spark of our thinking for collaborating. Very good. Thank you. A question from the group. Another one. Is there, a, is there such a thing as too crazy of an idea? And if well, there is, how can we identify these ideas? Okay, good. So um, this is a really interesting question. So Many of you have probably heard the phrase, there's no such thing as a stupid idea. And in a sense, that's true. But the reality is there are some ideas that are better than others or more appropriate for the problem we're trying to solve. So 
the most important thing that any organization can do or I can do in my personal or civic or volunteer life is be very clear about the problem I'm trying to solve. It turns out the greater focus I have, the more likely I am to come up with innovative solutions. So if I'm focused on what I'm trying to solve for, then suddenly I understand that in a world of great ideas, some of those ideas just aren't on the mark. Doesn't mean they're bad ideas. I'll save them for something else, but I wanna hone in on ideas that help me to achieve the result I'm hoping to achieve. All right, others who have questions, please, you can put them in the Q&A and we'll get to them as soon as we can. Another question for you. Uh, you spoke a lot about inventions and ideas that disrupted industries. What do you think is the most important and interesting disruptive innovation of the last few decades? Huh. No, so that's really gonna be hard to talk about. I mean, one thing I'd love all of you out there to think about is simply the notion of all of the things that didn't exist 15 or 20 years ago that are now a fundamental part of our lives. Um, so if I'm thinking about disruption, certainly, so imagine this, you know, I talked a little bit about the ability to have digital content on my phone. And so what is this, an iPhone 14? I can also say, um, I went, to Northwestern in the 1970s. When I had a project to do that required some analysis and brain power, I went to the Northwestern Computer Center, which was a ginormous building. And I'd punch key punch cards and submit them. And then they'd come back with a sheet of paper that said card 232 has an error, whatever the case is. My cell phone has way more brain power than this giant building that existed at Northwestern or IWU or the University of Michigan or any place. So this is an incredible tool. This is in the absence of me kind of getting out there and engaging the world, my window on the world. Anything I can imagine to Google, I can start to learn about. So that's important. But lots of other things are happening in lots of industries. It depends what industry you're working in. I think we're on the verge of seeing a breakthrough um, in what's called now personalized medicine. And that's the ability as opposed to taking a pill um, for a pharmaceutical company or a medical institution to understand our personal genome and then to craft some solutions for fixing something that's wrong with us. I think that's kind of awesome. It comes in a world in which we still have roughly 50% of all the medicines we have are derived from plants that people have known about for thousands of years. So I think that's kind of cool. So I think those are a few ideas, but there are a bunch of ideas. You know, I think the internet of things is awesome. I think I won't say this in front of a bunch of students, but the idea of, um, Chat GPT is kind of awesome, not to write papers that I'd turn in, um, but to ask the internet to help me to get smarter faster. So I, I think there are a lot of cool things that are happening. And so um, it would be hard to say one idea, but I think there's a lot of brilliant stuff going on out there. I think in the world of renewable energy, we're gonna make some breakthroughs, we're starting to. So I think there's awesome stuff. I would simply challenge all of the folks listening to be open to the possibility that you could participate in making something remarkable happen. All right, another question. Thank you. Another question from the audience. Uh, how do you approach or how do you recommend others approach and students specifically of uh, market research? Okay, so market research, that's kind of interesting. So Many of the students and many of the folks who are out there who were once students are probably enamored with what we now call design thinking, which is really the latest incarnation of innovative thinking. As part of the design thinking process, if we're doing it reasonably well, we interview potential customers or folks who are the target of our affection. I'd like to crank it up a notch. I think the best way we start to do market research for almost anything we're trying to do is to actually go out and immerse ourselves in the world of the potential customers 
or the potential people that we hope will benefit from whatever we're working on. So immersing ourselves means getting out and getting to know these folks. I think it's connecting with strangers. I think it's asking questions. I think it's taking a lot of notes. I think it's trying to understand what the people who we're trying to serve are trying to accomplish and in their wildest dreams, what would be an awesome product, service, or experience for them. So I think market research is really all about getting out there. Now, there are a lot of other tools that market research firms will claim provide some of the benefit, but the reality is kind of get out there and see how the world is changing and see what the lives of the folks you're serving are all about. Thank you for that answer. Another question from the audience. You previously mentioned one idea is to talk to people and connect with strangers. What advice would you provide for people who don't like talking to people or simply have a hard time making conversation with people? Okay, so that's an awesome question. And I get asked it a lot. And it turns out um, that a fair number of people are less inclined, whether they're introverted or not. I think all of us need to put ourselves in the situations where we feel comfortable. And so I think any of us can find places in which we could go and be connected with strangers. Um, for some people, it's gonna be more natural to strike up a conversation. But let's say, for example, that you're in a business or an industry, or you're at a university campus, in which you're taking a class or going to a workshop or going to a seminar, um, then I would be inclined then in being there to talk to other people around me and even just ask the simple question, what brings you here? Or why are you keen on this technology? Or in another sense, why are you at this restaurant or why are you going to this play? So I would certainly do that. Now, if that's even difficult for you, here's another thing that I would do. Let's say there's something interesting to you, but you don't know how to engage with other people. I'd do some research online. I'd find some people that are pretty smart about it. Um, I'd find some articles or something or blog post or webinar or something that they've done. And I would read about them or listen to them and discover a couple of ideas they have that are really powerful and compelling to me. Then I would send them a note. Remember, it's pretty easy to send a note as an introverted person. And I have to admit, I'm actually way more introverted than I might appear on this webinar. But the truth of the matter is, so now I write a note to those people and I don't just say, hey, I wanna connect with you. I write a note and say, I heard your talk or I read an article you wrote. And these were a couple of things you said that resonated with me. I would love to connect with you um, and learn more. Would you be open to that? My experience is 60 to 70% of people if you actually show that you took the time to get to understand what they're about, would be willing to talk with you. Same idea applies in a job search where you're trying to engage with a company or organization. Pick somebody in that company or organization that for some reason you can make a case why you admire them, reach out and connect with them. Thank you, Alan. We, we are coming up in, at the end of our scheduled time, and I know you're willing to stick around and answer any more questions that should come up in the Q&A, uh, but I want to break into this right now and just share some words of thanks uh, in case anyone needs to drop off. It, Alan, we really thank you for preparing and delivering this great talk. I mean, on unlocking the brilliance in ourselves and our colleagues, our workmates, our classmates, and our organizations. Uh, you've given us some really good, insightful and, and, and ways that we can take action uh, to create this. My biggest takeaway was the, the the mindset that you can grow in your in your nine points that you gave to us, uh, things that we can do to, to, to make ourselves and again, impact our organizations and ourselves to be more innovative and creative. To our audience, I want to thank you if you have to drop off for attending and asking such great questions. I'm going to take a look real quick to see if any more have come up. If you have another question you would like to ask, go ahead and ask it now. We'll get it addressed for you as quickly as we can. Give people another 10 seconds or so to finish their typing if they've got one started. I think everyone's got the questions asked that they wanted to ask. Yeah, and Alan, feel did you have any last thoughts you wanted to share? No, I mean, 
Um, if you've been part of this webinar or you'll listen to it once it's put up by the university, um, feel free to connect with me. If you have another question, feel free to send it to me either through LinkedIn or email or Instagram or whichever social media you prefer. And I'd be delighted to engage with you and uh, share if I have any insight. I'd be glad to do that. So thanks again awesome. for the opportunity that. to we'll make sure. We will thank you. We'll make sure we share out your, your contact information. Appreciate you allowing us to do that and uh, sharing your video. I'm sure others will benefit greatly in saying this. Again, we thank you for spending time with our Titan community today. Okay. And, thank and, you and thanks much. everyone for tuning in. Thanks. We hope to see you from the next Titan Talks uh, coming up in June and from Bloomington, our hosts there uh, behind the scenes who helped make this happen from Silver Spring, Maryland and from Barcelona. Take care and go Titans. Thank you very much. Thanks. Take care.